It's time again for Around the Nest, Jay Talk on our way around the Toronto Blue Jays organization. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler with the Lansing Lugnuts, and during this week's show, we'll start off our way in AAA with Ben Wagner with the Buffalo Bisons, and we'll make our way right on down through AA New Hampshire, A Advanced in Eden, Single A Lansing, Short Season A Vancouver, and Rookie Advanced Bluefield. So let us begin with the Bluefield Bisons and their radio broadcaster, Ben Wagner, freshly back from the All-Star break. Ben, how was your break? Uh, It was wonderful, productive, and relaxing all at the same time. So a lot of housework, but a little bit of R&R at the same time. So all missions accomplished. It was a question sent in from Bluebird Banter via one of their commenters. What exciting things does a broadcaster do during the All-Star break, or is it mostly trying to take a break? I use it to totally recharge. If there is, there has been some excitement, you know, day trips here or there. We've gone to Toronto in the past. We've gone through the Niagara Escarpment, which is wine country in Western New York. The other things that we've done in the past, obviously go back to Indiana, spend some time with friends and family there. But I channel those three days, nothing more than to recharge, hopefully the batteries to, for, for, for me, it's always a wind sprint to the finish on the minor league side because, the Major League All-Star break coincides with the AAA All-Star break. So the Bisons have 46 games left now in the year. I mean, that's way past the midway point. So two-thirds of the way through the season already. So uh, I always feel like it's a wind sprint all the way to the finish. Um, and by, by this time of year, Buffalo really is experiencing nice weather, so there's plenty of opportunity to get a lot of the yard work done. Ben Wagner, the voice of the Buffalo Bisons, one game into the second half of the season. Let's turn our attention back to that All-Star game. Liam Hendricks received the start for the International League All-Stars against the PCL, and nothing new for Liam. Two scoreless innings, four strikeouts. He picked up the win. How closely were you paying attention to the AAA All-Star game? Watched every pitch when Liam was on the mound, and then when Bobby Karecki later on the ball game came into the contest as well, my attention, while well, I had it on the background, you know, through the middle innings, when Bobby went out there too, you know, I obviously was going to watch how he performed. Both are tremendous stories in Buffalo this year. And Liam was Liam, two scoreless innings, getting the nod, 25 pitches, 19 for strikes, and he threw nothing but fastballs. And he said, why, why try to do anything different than what you've been really trying to do and be successful with all season long? So uh, he wanted to throw his best stuff out there and, and see where that took him. And obviously striking out four got him the nod to be the player of the game. Bobby Karecki and Liam Hendricks were two of what was scheduled to be three Buffalo Bisons in the All-Star game. Dan Johnson got the call up, so he was not in it and not in the All-Star game home run derby. I was reading the story about how Dan Johnson found out that he had gotten the call, that his name wasn't in the original starting lineup the day after Adam Lind was hurt, and then suddenly his name was in the starting lineup and he had to play that game, and then he found out after the game. What was your perspective? Well, it was a little bit of a sweat it out and let's see what happens scenario. Um, that night in Buffalo, the first lineup that went up, and it's not it's not totally out of the norm to have multiple lineups appear, you know, over the course of any day at AAA. Um, you know, lineups change, you know, be determined on who may be needed at the big league level or somebody gets scratched because of an injury at the big league level or um, – I don't know, a number of reasons, you know, that, that can change a lineup over the course of the day. Maybe somebody just pulls up lame in, in batting practice. But um, not seeing Dan Johnson's name up there was a little bit for, 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 of a surprise for me because Dan had played literally every game throughout the course of the season, and he had been a stalwart in a cleanup spot, uh, whether he's DHing or playing first base. So you walk in, you immediately notice name's not in there, and knowing the – situation that the big league club was in automatically you start to spin your wheels and think about different scenarios on why he would be left out and maybe how quickly he can go up and join the big club and then all of a sudden I walk back through the clubhouse and see a refreshed lineup and Dan Johnson's back in there so I thought oh well maybe Lynn's going to check out okay or maybe something else was was happening in terms of a potential trade I don't know You, you you weigh all these variables and you think about the number of different talking points So you could have a very good conversation, hopefully, for your listeners that night and and play it all out and fill up a number of why things could happen or couldn't happen. We weren't joined by you last week, but there was a question sent in for AAA, 
and it revolved around Corey Aldrich. A lot of fun about how Corey is, in addition to being the kind of personality that he is, he is a food connoisseur. Um, have you had any great conversations with Corey so far? Uh, all the all the good conversations that I have had are baseball related, and in terms of his travels and why he uh, stayed in the ball game, but nothing nothing of uh, of delicacies yet. So I think I think the the viewer, the listener, or the the writer at least for another layup of conversation during a pregame interview in the near future. I do appreciate that. <laughs> All right, turning our attention back to baseball, your first game of the second half, and immediately there's something to talk about, and it's from a guy who pitched one inning. Aaron Sanchez gets moved to the bullpen and sends up a hula blue. I caught it on hardball talk. It's being reported around Toronto. The Jays are shifting Sanchez to the bullpen to prepare him for the call-up. So did you see anything different from him out of the pen compared to Aaron Sanchez, the starter? Uh, not really, no. He obviously spent a lot of time during the day figuring out what his game plan would be, knowing that he would throw last night. And so he was not waiting on the phone to ring, let's put it that way. He knew that he would have to have his body ready and loose in terms of getting prepared for that appearance later on in the game. It was only going to be one inning. Um, You saw all four seam fastballs, you know, between 96 and 98 miles an hour. It was a little high in the zone, though. And once he found the sinker and he was throwing the two-seamer, that was further down in the zone and a much more effective pitch. That's what was able to induce the outs. Curveball was still fall off the table good and didn't see a lot of change-ups from him last night, but the the fastball combination with the curveball was just as crisp as what we had seen over the last couple of starts. But I can say that this is a role that he is embracing. He totally understands it. And whether it's setting up a potential big league call-up or not, he's not thinking about that. Gary Allison also pointed out in our pregame conversation yesterday you have to watch a guy that's still 22 years of age in his overall innings flux. So while that's a little bit of a company line, obviously you can read some of the tea leaves as well and how this plays out in the struggles that the bullpen has had in Toronto, but you can also see the concern in terms of development where you need to start weaning back on some of these guys' innings. You can't make a jump from 90 to 140 innings. You're just not going to have that. So you, you have to be careful of how much time they log out on the mound, but um, it was exciting to see Aaron and how he embraces this role. He's going to have a couple of days off, and then he'll get another inning worth of work. And over the next seven days, we'll see how not only it plays out in terms of how he performs on the field, but also how his body responds to this new role, because it's not in terms of every fifth day or where he's going to get frequent side work and then get cranked up for that turn in the rotation. The bigger story is that Buffalo fell. It was the Bison's fourth consecutive defeat. They're beginning the second half, post-All-Star break, on the road, on the road four games at Pawtucket, two games at Lehigh Valley, and then a nice 10-game homestand back at Coca-Cola Field. Uh, What do you think about the Bison's chances to really take advantage of that time at home and push forward to a potential wild-card berth? Well, I think the time has to happen before even Buffalo gets back home. Pawtucket and Lehigh Valley on this road trip, they're not very strong offensive teams. The Bisons need to get their offense started, and that's been a bugaboo for the Bisons recently over the last three weeks, and specifically dropping nine out of the last 12 ball games to go back two games under the 500 mark. Uh, so the offense is clearly the, the reason that the Bisons are struggling. Their offense only, or I'm sorry, their pitching staff has all year allowed four runs or less uh, when they've been out on the mound. So you got a good shot with Esmiel Rogers on the hill today. If the offense can somehow wake up and start to drive in runs, because one or two runs every night is just not going to get it done. Wrapping things up with Ben Wagner with the Buffalo Bosons, two questions of the week, one for Around the Nest and one sent in via Bluebird Banter. And the question of the week sent in via SB Nation via Bluebird Banter is simply, who is the best defensive player on your team? Well, Ryan Goins hasn't made an error since May 31st, and he has done everything up the middle of the diamond and seesawing back and forth with Jonathan Diaz night in and night out. Gogo's going to start at shortstop tonight. Um, he is about as slick as you can you can find on the, on the diamond, and the combination with Jonathan Diaz, it's nearly a toss-up with the way that those two guys played defensively. Uh, the Buffalo fans have been, and I have 
also been treated as well to Anthony Ghost. Tremendous jumps, makes very difficult plays in the alley or straight back in center field. Look at the end of the play, very routine. And he's, in the last 10 days, had two of the more spectacular catches the minor league baseball has seen this year. Going back on a ball in Rochester and pulling back a Wilkin Ramirez home run where it was captured so greatly by uh, Justin Germano from the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle. At the apex of the leap, you can see the glove extending over the other line and then pulling it back in. And then Ghost goes gliding through the right center field gap just a Coca-Cola field prior to his call-up and, and makes a great grab just feet away from the wall, mid-flight, crashing into the wall and holding on to it just as the ball nestles into the web of his club. Um, you know, those are three guys that are plus defenders that Buffalo has had, not only this year, but in terms of Goins and and Anthony Ghost. You know, we've seen him last year, too. So uh, it's really been a treat to watch those guys uh, in two very different roles play such brilliant defense. And lastly, for Ben Wagner with Buffalo, what's the quickest way you've seen a non-impact player become an impact player or a non-prospect suddenly become a prospect? Well, the first guy that came to mind was pre-Blue Jays affiliation, and that was Josh Edgen. And somebody that had barely been out of A-ball got an opportunity to start the season in Double A in 2012 and then just brought lights out stuff coming from three-quarter arm slot on the left side fastball around 95 miles an hour and a wipeout slider and he took his he took you know his ability all the way to the big leagues that year and it's been up and down with the Mets ever since that's the guy that just was came out of nowhere now this year's version for me is Rob Rasmussen a guy that has been a starter his entire career through UCLA early in his player development as well and then now with his new role in the Blue Jays organization said all right well, we're going to try you out of the bullpen and he's really cut loose. He's got nasty sink on the fastball. He can reach back at 94, 95 miles an hour with the heater. And then the breaking ball, too, that he has you know, been able to use so successfully here in Buffalo. It's really been a big surprise. And it's no surprise, you know, that they want that power left-handed arm in the big leagues, and that's why he's got a couple of looks in Toronto this season. The tremendous insight of Ben Wagner. You can find him on Twitter, at Ben Wag, 24-7, the Buffalo Bosons online at bisons.com. Ben, thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Looking forward to next week. All right. Till next Friday. Moving down the ladder to double A, let's join in with Tom Gauff here in New Hampshire. Tom, how was your all-star break? You know, my all-star break was good, Jesse. Unfortunately, it was about a day or so too short. In the Eastern League, we're blessed with a two-day all-star break. So uh, we we were a little fortunate that we had a game in Portland, Maine on Monday. So it was just a short drive back to New Hampshire, get back around, I don't know, 5.30, 6 o'clock, and then did get to enjoy two full days. But a third day would have been nice, especially for the guys traveling to the All-Star game some 600 miles away in Altoona. Did you watch any of the Eastern uh, the Eastern League All-Star game? Probably, uh, I shouldn't admit this, but I did not watch a single second of the Eastern League All-Star game. I, tried to, I was going to listen to it at one point and then got distracted and never got a chance to do it, so... Uh, unfortunately, I, I did not watch a single moment of it, but I don't think that my wife was upset about that. <laughs> I can imagine. All right, so off we go. Now, July 17th, you're one game in. Uh, victory over the Portland Sea Dogs yesterday. And it looks like Johnny Anderson's looking very good out of the pen in support of Scott Copeland. You know, and I can't wait to talk to Bobby Meacham. After we get done with you guys, we're going to go down and talk to Bobby about that. And that's going to be the first question I have is, uh, you know, he's seen John Anderson for two years now. Last year, Anderson was getting healthy, was on a very reg- regimented routine, pitch a day, have a couple of days off, pitch a day, and, and so forth throughout the season. And now they're sort of, you know, they're starting to take the, the training wheels off in one aspect in terms of they're letting him pitch a little more uh, on, a, a, on, a, on a less tight schedule, but he's not pitching as much because we've had so many double headers of late, and we have one coming up on Monday, and he'll start game two of that one where, He's had to be held back to be able to throw 60, 70, 80 pitches in some of these games, but he has been wiped out from the guy that started the season where he couldn't throw strikes. Uh, he'd walk a lot of guys. He probably walked about 75% of the first hitters that he faced coming into games, was constantly in trouble, had an ERA over six for a while now, and all of a sudden the guy that's posted a 172 since June 3rd, which is coincidentally right around the time that we started to turn around our season as a team. So, it's been fun to watch, and when a guy throws like he does, 94-95, and pitches with confidence, doesn't pitch backwards with curveballs and breaking balls and change-ups, it's been fun to watch. And last night was another night where he comes on and you say, 
Sea Dogs have no chance tonight, and lo and behold, two shutouts, three Ks, no hits. With his story, with the weight that he's had to come back from the double Tommy John reconstructive surgeries, can you think of anyone else that you either is on New Hampshire this year or past seasons and past ball clubs that you've been with who've had to overcome those kinds of obstacles? You know, I, I really can't think of anybody like that. Randy Boone comes to mind. He's had, I don't know, if, I can't remember if it was Labrum or Tommy John. I think it was Tommy John had that a couple of years ago, was a starter when he first came into the Blue Jays organization. So I think that he's probably a guy that comes to mind, you know, the, the, the last two seasons he really wasn't healthy with the Fisher Cats, missed most of 2012 because of the surgery, and then, you know, came back at the end, really didn't pitch all that much. Last year was injured early, missed about, four or five weeks early in the season and then had another little setback midseason. This is the first year he's been healthy. Um, so I think a guy like that comes to mind, and, and not only the injuries, but just the fact that he's not a priority guy anymore. And he's been in double-A for parts of five seasons now and starter, reliever, starter, and now back to relieving again and really pitching well. And I think that there's sort of a role found for him now, which is a nice thing too. I feel awful for saying this, even though we just had a monster month of, I believe this is the first time we've talked about Matt Newman with you on the show. Tell me about how Newman's playing for New Hampshire. Well, if we played the Sea Dogs every day, he'd be in the big leagues in two weeks because he's hitting about 500 against Portland. He has 19 hits in 11 games, which obviously is a very small sample size, but he's just killed the Sea Dogs, and we played him five games this past weekend, and obviously we're playing him right now with uh, a game last night and then three more to come through Sunday. Uh, but he's actually found his he's found his niche. I mean, he was a good hitter last year in Dunedin, started out a little slowly in Dunedin this year, and then started to turn it around, and that's kind of what he did with us here as well. Ended up having a very good month of June where he had a lot of doubles, a lot of extra base hits. Not a big power guy. He's not going to hit 10 or 12 home runs in all likelihood by the end of the season. Uh, but in this ballpark, he, he may hit a few extra being a left-handed hitter here, but just turning into a very good hitter. And, and to tell you where Bobby Meacham has placed him in the lineup, he's batted him third for pretty much the last three weeks, exactly where he hit him last year. Maybe not the guy you think is going to hit third, but when he's in that position, he produces. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at your box score from yesterday, and the way that starting lineup looks, there's some, some surprising names to me batting in the spots that they're in, like seeing Kevin Nolan batting in the cleanup spot. How often has he, has he been used there for the Cavs? That's only his second game as a cleanup hitter, actually. And, and for Nolan, a lot like Newman, uh, Kevin has been – uh, outstanding against Portland, hitting over 300 against them. But in the last month, right around that, you know, that first first part of June, middle of June, he's been one of our best hitters. In fact, I think he's leading the club in average during that time, hitting about 380 in the last 23 games. He's got a bunch of doubles in that stretch. And this is a guy that's hitting 245. And you say, I never thought he'd get there because he was below the Mendoza line about a month ago, hitting 189, 190. He may have a three-hit game, and then he'll go 0 for 12. He's been phenomenal of late. He's hitting balls hard. He's been, I don't want to say a little more aggressive, but maybe a little more uh, uh, selectively aggressive, if you will, swinging a lot more strikes and has really had a, a nice month here. And hopefully for him, it'll, it'll keep going and, and he'll have a strong finish to the season because for a while there, it looked pretty bleak for Kevin Nolan. Tom Goff here of the AA New Hampshire Fisher Cats. There are two questions of the week. The first from Bluebird Banter, who is the best defensive player on the team? Oh, boy, we've had so many players that I don't know that it's fair to really put a, a best defensive tag on anybody. A.J. Jimenez probably would have been my first uh, my first answer beginning of the season, but even he didn't have a typical A.J. Jimenez year while he was in double-A. Sal Fasano said that he's he's kind of right of the ship since he's been promoted to triple-A and, and playing for a team that was a little more competitive. He was with us in that really tough streak, and there were a few games where it almost didn't look like he was all that excited to be out there. It was kind of just... Uh, you know, kind of grinding his way through. But I guess he's, he's turned it around in AAA. Derek Chung has been outstanding. Uh, he's thrown out 50% of base dealers, threw out another guy last night, a very under-assuming guy behind the plate. You don't think much when you see him. And then all of a sudden, quick release and a cannon to second base. Uh, and then I probably have to say Dalton Pompey. He made a catch the other day in Portland. Uh, actually, maybe in this ballpark. Just hammered the center field, ran it down. It was a little fade over his shoulder. Caught it like it was nothing. Avoided the wall and made a great catch. So he's, he's probably the guy that I would go with now, but Kenny Wilson's been pretty good. Um, you know, we've seen some good defense at times out of John Birdie, the catchers, as I mentioned, and Mike McDade was actually having a really good season defensively before he went up to triple a Buffalo. The New Hampshire Fisher cats are at home. Matt boy gets to start tonight, 7.05 PM. It's New Hampshire against Portland. Our final question for Tom is the question of the week. And that is 
what is the quickest or perhaps the suddenest that you've seen a non-prospect become a prospect? You know, I, I thought about this, Jesse, and I, three answers came to mind. One of them was before he got to New Hampshire, so we technically didn't witness it, but Kevin Pillar being a 32nd round draft pick out of a small Division II school, coming into to professional ball, making the double jump in his second year from, from Lansing to Dunedin and just tearing up uh, pitchers at the Florida State League and the Midwest League levels, but then continuing that when he gets to double A, which was really impressive last season, and then obviously making it to the major leagues at the end of last year as well, another double jump for him. He comes to mind, although we didn't see him really become a prospect. He was already sort of burgeoning and one of those guys where they thought, can you do it at, double a, at the double A level? And, and lo and behold, he could. I thought of Matt Moore. He was with us in 2009 in Bowling Green, throwing 89, 90, maybe occasionally touching 91, 92. And then by the time I left there in 2011, we're watching him strike out eight or nine in a five-inning gem in a playoff game against the Texas Rangers, throwing 95 to 98 miles an hour. And again, a guy that didn't necessarily do it in our place, but just a short two years later, he was one of the best pitchers in the minor leagues. And then lastly, the guy that I thought fit the answer best was Ryan Goins, who Ben had mentioned defensively. This is where he really kind of made that leap into being a prospect. Uh, being a prospect, he was a guy that hit really well here. John not only worked a lot with him and really sort of unleashed him because. Goins was a, a bit of a slap hitter recording in Nunnally before he came to New Hampshire. And then Nunnally said, hey, you're not fast enough to be a guy that just slaps at the shortstop and tries to beat it out. Drive the ball. Had a lot of doubles that year, was our best player, ended up being our team MVP. And then, as Ben mentioned, the, def- the defense by Ryan Goins, a guy that was at shortstop, they said he had marginal, uh, marginal defensive abilities. He had one of the strongest arms on this team. I can't tell you how many times, probably four or five at least, where he'd get a relay throw we're ready to chuck up a run at home plate, and then he just guns a guy down with an absolute bullet throw from shallow in the outfield somewhere to cut a run down at the plate on a throw that made him just go, did that really just happen? So I, I would say Ryan Goins is probably my number one answer for that. Ryan Goins, superlative defender. You can find Tom Gauthier on Twitter, T-O-M-G-A-U-T-H-I-E-R-21, at Tom Gauthier. Meanwhile, the New Hampshire Fisher Cats online are nhfishercats.com. Tom, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. All right. From Tom in double-A, let's bring in Tyler Murray, the voice of the people from the Class A events and even Blue Jays. Tyler, now you didn't get an all-star break, the likes of which double-A or triple-A got, but you kicked back and watched the Major League Baseball All-Star game. Yes, indeed. Uh, The Florida State League gets a league-wide day off, so everybody can enjoy that. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and it was a good day yesterday for the team because they snapped a five-game losing skid, so getting back on the right track. More fun to watch the Major League Baseball All-Star game or to watch Kendall Graveman pitch? Hmm. You know, I'm going to go Kendall Graveman. I have to. He was great again last night, went seven innings again, and he's given up just five total earned runs in his last seven starts combined. So he's pitching right now like one of the better arms in all of the Florida State League, so hopefully he can keep things up. Really working well with that cutter sinker combination and the sliders working well and I think we talked about this last week but we saw Kendall Graveman clock into the lower and now towards the mid 90s with a sinker ball around 94 with pretty good consistency and he can keep that going and he's certainly going to be able to take the next step very soon well let me ask you was there an adjustment he had to make once he arrived at the Florida State League from Lansing I think he just got a little bit unlucky at first uh, he faced the Tampa Yankees twice and the very first inning he pitched in the FSL was on the road at George M. Steinbrenner Field, which is a cavernous, gigantic ballpark, and they were able to find a lot of holes through the infield against him with some seeing-eye ground balls and stuff like that. But eventually, once he just you know got his feet underneath him and got confident um, and started working well with Derek Chung and now the new catcher, Santiago Nessi and Jorge size, I think his confidence is sky high, and you know there's <laughs> truly no hitting him right now in the FSL. Compare and contrast. In the first half of the season, you had Mike Reeves and you had Derek Chung, uh, What's the difference between those two players and, say, your new catchers and Jorge Saiz and Santiago Nessie? Well, it's a really fun learning process, I think, for both Saiz and Nessie. For a guy like Derek Chung, who spent the entire year here last year, there wasn't a very long adjustment period for him, at least as far as I could tell, getting to know all the pitchers on the staff, as we had a good amount of returning players to start the year. But now it's just a very interesting dynamic to see developing between, you know, Saiz, Nessie, and the rest of the uh, battery here as the Blue Jays are heading towards you know, the latter end of the second half. And for, for me, I think size is bad. It's really been a pleasant surprise, not just here in Dunedin, but 
for you guys down in Lansing. And Nessie's really showing some power ability, hitting the gaps very well. And when he gets doubles, he gets <laughs> real doubles. They're not uh, little dribblers that find their way down the line. He really wallops the ball into the gap, and he's looked very good this year. And there's obviously going to be a little bit of development to be done behind the play with Nessie, but size seems like he's right there. And he's been able to catch Frank Viola, the third knuckleball, quite well. So I've been very impressed with what size and Nessie have been able to do so far. The interesting thing to me is seeing where they've been batting in your order, either the fifth or the sixth spot, with those current DJs now batting seventh or eighth or ninth, that they've filled some power, some run-producing roles for Denise. Oh, absolutely. And we saw Jorge's size on Monday in Fort Myers nearly lead the yard for his first time in a Denise uniform. It was a wall-to-wall double about halfway up the fence in Fort Myers, so he really has been finding some good pitches to hit. And there are some pretty good battles in this lineup right now. You look at a guy like Dwight Smith Jr., we always talk about how well he's been doing in the three spot with in the month of July. I think he's played 13 games now in July, all hitting third, and he's batting 398. So it really has been impressive to, I guess, set the table a bit for the guys in the middle and bottom of the order, like he was doing as a leadoff man to set things up for Ponte and Hobson, who are, of course, up in double A right now. So I think we're not necessarily seeing – one guy leading the way. It's been a great balance of efforts from one through nine in the lineup, and that's a big reason why the Blue Jays are able to stay afloat, I think, in the second-half playoff race, although we know they already clinched the first-half title. This is Tyler Murray of the Dunedin Blue Jays, Class A Advanced in the Toronto Blue Jays organization. They're listening to Around the Nest, Jay talking around of the Jays' farm system. Let's get off the field just for a moment, because I saw that there was a promotion that the DJs did and that you do every year. It has to do with pizza, and the winning pizza slice is preserved. Is this true? Oh, yes, for sure. It was uh, all-you-can-eat pizza last night, $12. Um, everyone had a great time. We had uh, best specialty pizza, best dessert pizza, best any kind of pizza you can think of. So that was a lot of fun, and, yes, I got to dig into some delicious Italian pizza yesterday. So that was a lot of fun, and we gave out some cool trophies this year. Uh, they're just pretty much ceramic pizzas, so it was it was definitely a good time. We had some great crowds this week in Dunedin, so it's been a lot of fun. Did you agree with the winners? Uh, it's tough to say. Um, I was actually filling in on public address the last couple of days, so I didn't get to go down and sample everything. I was kind of locked in, so I had plenty of pizza brought up. I think the specialty pizza winner was from BJ's Brew House, which is actually a chain that some fans might be familiar with, and uh, that was definitely the specialty pizza winner. It had a lot of cheese, and the sauce was just pieces of tomato. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. You're making me hungry, though, Jesse. <laughs> a question I love asking every single person who's ever got on the PA, what was your favorite name to announce? Plus, I had fun with uh, Peter Mooney. Eric Sakula was a lot of fun. It was just it was, it was a unique experience, and I went way over the top, as you might imagine. I mean, you know me. But just getting the chance to <laughs> have the guys hear you, you know, show your support for them. It's one thing on the radio, of course, you've got the families listening, but when you have the team listening, and uh, it, it's a bit of a different feel. So, yeah, Sakula was fun, Mooney was fun, and Kevin Patterson, I got into his name a little bit uh, because he had predicted to hit a home run before the game, and it actually happened in the fourth inning, so that was a lot of fun. Who predicted that he was going to hit a home run? Well, his dad was here for his 56th birthday, and Kevin said, you know what, Pops, I'm hitting a home run for you today. And he didn't know it was against Trevor Williams, an all-star pitcher who had given up just three home runs in his first 17 starts this year, but he took him deep and no doubt shot over the right field fence, and on his way to first base, he pointed behind the dugout where his dad was sitting, so that was a Pretty classic baseball moment last night. We have to get to our two questions of the week before we move on down to Lansing, but I have to ask, with Kevin Patterson as the subject, what is the longest home run that you've seen him hit this year? Oh, man, uh, you, you spent uh, spring training here just this past season in Dunedin, and beyond the right field fence they have offices, and even beyond that there are cars, and he's hit a couple of cars in the parking lot, and that's got to be at least 500 feet away. We saw... Gustavo Pierre right nearly clear the batter's eye in center field last year, and Kevin Patterson's shown some similar power, obviously even better power. Right now, Jesse, he uh, is third best in the Florida State League in at-bats between home runs with around one homer every 21 or 22 at-bats, and uh, he doesn't have the A-Bs yet to qualify for the league leaders, but if he did have enough, he'd be in third right now, which is pretty impressive considering the in-and-out experience that he's had in the lineup, and now that he's getting some more consistent playing time, he's certainly rewarding the coaching staff for putting him in there more. 
Let's get into our questions of the week with Tyler Murray with the Dunedin Blue Jays. First from Bluebird Banter, who's the best defensive player on the team? Best defensive player, you have to look at the shortstop, Peter Mooney. Uh, we say it a lot, but in terms of the transfer from glove to throwing hand, I don't think anybody does it quicker. And he's not the biggest guy. He's maybe not the fastest guy, but he's so quick. He's got such good range and reaction time that Mooney really has been impressive this year's shortstop, the same as last year as well. And I think we all know about Dalton Pompey, what he was able to do here in the first half. And you saw him win the minor league baseball center fielder's gold glove award last season. So I'd have to go with Mooney on the infield and Pompey in the outfield. Beautiful. And finally, our Around the Nest question of the week. What is the quickest or most sudden, perhaps most unexpected, that you've seen a non-prospect go to becoming a prospect? I mean, there are definitely a lot of options out there, and that's the beauty of minor league baseball. Uh, as they say, if you've got a uniform, you've got a chance. But the one that sticks out in my mind is, is Matt Newman. He was a – I know you and Tom talked about him a little bit, but he was a non-drafted free agent out of Arizona State a couple of years ago won a title in Vancouver, and then last year jumped all the way up to Dunedin, had a great season, finished batting 290, leading the team with an awesome month of July and August. And started the season here, even though he was supposed to be beginning the year in A, I think it was involved in one of the acquisitions they made with Matt Tuyasa Sopo. He was put in A, so Matt stayed down here, but worked hard, got back up to A, and he's doing very well right now. It was a slow start for him, but as he's getting a little more playing time, you heard it from Tom, he's really heating up a little bit, so... For a guy who wasn't drafted, and I don't even think he got the senior signing bonus that most senior signs get because he finished school after his junior year, uh, Matt Newman really has taken off, and uh, it's good to see him succeeding up in double-A. You can find Tyler Murray on Twitter, LT underscore Murray. That's very simple. Meanwhile, the Dunedin Blue Jays, <laughs> find them online at DunedinBlueJays.com. Tyler, thank you very much. All right, Jesse, talk to you soon. You got it. All right, let's move on down the ladder. And now to single A Lansing, Michigan, with the Midwest League's lug nuts, Trey Wilson. Trey, how did you spend your Major League Baseball All-Star game? Uh, well, it was one of our rare off days, obviously, which I'm, I know is the case with everybody else who's gone so far. But um, I sat around, and people said, you should stay away from baseball all day today. So naturally, <laughs> I did spend some time picking up the guitar, but – I mostly played MLB The Show and watched the All-Star game. Perfect. Trey, there's a question sent in from Bluebird Banter wondering about Shane Dawson. It goes a little bit like this. There was some discussion that as good as he was, he didn't look as good as in Bluefield last year. Is it about his stuff being down, or is it simply about being less dominant due to better hitting competition? Uh, Well, you and I talked about this uh, some on the broadcast the other night. Um, It's he's not looking as dominant because he has morphed himself into a different style of pitcher. And I don't know what his personal reasons for are for that, but he's still kind of figuring some things out. Yes, the competition's better. um, But last year in Bluefield, he would be a majority fastball pitcher and um, throw pretty hard. Uh, You know, he'd be in the low nineties and he would work both corners of the plate very well. He had he and Tom Robson when they were working in their piggyback tandem together. It was a night where you know you're not going to see many walks and you're going to see probably two of the best command guys in that league. That was 2013. Uh, this year he has really junking it up, and uh, you can talk on this some as well because obviously you've seen it as much as I have. But uh, he's he's taking the fastball and he's putting really as much emphasis on that fastball, and he's. Uh, really becoming kind of a wizard at changing speeds. He's getting to be kind of an oddball of a pitcher for the way that pitching goes these days. You know, he's he, like, he wants to see how slow he can throw some of his pitches. Um, he was so good a couple of nights ago because not only was he changing speeds ridiculously well between his fastball, that uh, spike curveball that he throws, and whatever else, He's even working in there. From night to night, you never know what he's going to throw. I wouldn't be surprised if he's out there throwing palm balls and, and all these other weird different things to try to change the look and change the speed. But he uh, he really had the King County Cougars off balance the entire night. It was it was something to see. From Shane Dawson on the mound, the Lugnuts have had a player in the starting lineup in Dowell Lugo who it's as if everything that approaches him is coming at nice, slow, and fast and he's been crushing it. 
Has there been a difference? What's going on with Dawel Lugo within the past week? Um, he's gotten a little bit more patient. We've seen that. He's not swinging at literally every single pitch. He had gotten into a habit of he was hacking. If there was a pitch coming in, he was taking the swing. And he was still pretty much making that work. But now he's gotten a little bit patient. He's uh, waiting for pitches that he should be swinging at. And um, a couple of other small things, they've worked, I mean, the confidence, I think, is big. He is up going up there right now knowing, or I'm assuming he's knowing that he's going to clobber the ball, and he has been doing just that. Um, nothing else has really changed in the yard because the quick hands and everything were there. I think it's an approach thing for him. Joined by Trey Wilson of the Lansing Lugnuts on Around the Nest. Jay talking our way around the Toronto Blue Jays organization. So the Lugnuts are back home. Welcoming in the first place, King County Cougars. They've split the first two games of this series, and they're receiving production not just from Lugo and from the usual suspects, Matt Dean, Derek Loveless, but David Harris has now been inserted in at the top of the lineup. What have you seen from David? Well, David Harris so far, I mean, as a top-of-the-order guy, his approach as well has changed at the plate, and now he's definitely going with the – going up to the plate with the thought of, okay, let's get on base. Um, his first game as a leadoff hitter against Bowling Green over the weekend, he had a home run in his first at bat, and he let off the game with the home run. So, that, I mean, of course, that was good to see. He's got great power, but now he's uh, he's slowed it down a little bit, and he, like Lugo, is uh, he, he's taking more pitches. He's um, working the count, which for a leadoff guy is a little bit more important than most other guys in the order, obviously. Um He's working. He's worked a few walks here and there, which we had not seen from him at all before. He, had strike, he was striking out quite a bit, but he wasn't working any walks. Now he's finding any way that he can to get on base. And he went from being a guy down in the order who was kind of a run producer, showing that he can now be a table setter. He's got pretty good speed. Um, it hasn't translated in stolen bases yet. He's had some trouble with stealing bases, but... He has, he has pretty good speed. We've seen it defensively, and we've seen it from him on the base paths as far as advancing or maybe taking an extra base here or there or scoring, making scoring plays that would be close for some guys, just no chance to throw them out, coming around third and scoring. Um, defensively, he's of course, he's been an infielder most of his career, uh, going through college and everything, but he has not shown any troubles that I can think of maybe a slightly misread ball here or there out in left field, but it doesn't look like there are some guys that we have seen over the course of, you know, any season converted infielders turned outfielders that don't get great reads on the ball. They don't take great routes. We haven't seen that from David Harris. He, he seems to have a very good natural understanding of how to be a corner outfielder with a shortstop's arm to go with it as well. So he's got a couple of outfield assists, I believe, already since he's joined us, and uh, he's, I tell you, he, he might be so far this season one of the most surprising players that I've seen because for me personally and for you, neither one of us had seen really any of him. We knew that he was with Vancouver last year, but I had never seen him play, and I'm pretty sure you had never seen him play either, no, so he's come he through. He wasn't and, even on my radar. Yeah, he's been he's been very impressive. I think that he's been quite a nice surprise, and um, – some people may think uh, he's he's turned himself into a bit of a – I think he could be a legitimate prospect candidate at this point with what we've seen, the tools that he has, his baseball instincts, and his his ability to be a versatile player. You know, he can be a leadoff guy. He can be a run producer. And, obviously, if you need him to play somewhere defensively, he'll go out there and he'll do a great job doing that. Let's get to our questions of the week with Trey Wilson of the Lansing Lugnuts. First from Bluebird Banter, who is the best defensive player on the team? Um, Jason Lublabesian, I think, would have to be the go-to, not only for just making every routine play and making them all look routine. It's it's about as automatic as you could ask for, but uh, making the spectacular plays. We haven't seen any from him in a while. He just hasn't had a lot of opportunities, but... Um, you and I have both seen it. He has tremendous athleticism. Um, he's not the fastest guy, but he's got a, he gets up to speed quick, and he cuts off some balls back behind second base if he's playing on the infield, or if he's playing at second, I should say, or shortstop, really either one. Um, he has a very good arm, and 
he has great reaction time to really break on some balls or uh, do whatever he has to do to get there. And he's, I can't think of how many runs he's probably saved as a defender this year. Uh, as far as maybe another spectacular defensive player, in the outfield, I think Derek Loveless has proven himself to be a really good corner outfielder over the course of this year defensively. He's got uh, solid speed. Not going to blow anybody away, but he's got good recovery speed if he does rarely get a misread. But also he can run down some balls, and sometimes you think, okay, I uh, didn't think he would get there, but he did. Not going to blow you away with the speed, but it's there. But also his arm is very good. He has a very strong arm like with Harris. And obviously D.J. Davis, um, there, he is a little bit more inconsistent, but his, his ability to track down balls, everybody talks about his speed. The biggest place where we have seen it has been defensively. He takes away some extra base hits and makes it look easy because he's so quick in the outfield. Honorable mention to Mitch Ney at third base as well. He, he does a great job there. Uh, solid corner infielder. Finally, before we mosey our way down the ladder and go to Vancouver, the around the nest question of the week is simply any players stand out in your mind as in going from non prospect to prospect suddenly and unexpectedly? Uh, we see that happen a lot in the other direction, unfortunately, obviously. But the <laughs> biggest one, and I've, uh, I've talked about him before on this show and on, the, on broadcast because it was, you know, I don't have nearly as many years as some of the other broadcasters in the system. This is my, uh, you know, just a few years. Uh, doing radio and covering minor league baseball in general. But what I saw out of Kevin Pillar in 2011, the turnaround that he had, you know, being his first uh, professional season, um, started off the year so slow. Him being a 30-second-round draft pick wasn't even really an everyday starter for part of the first part of the season. And by the end of that, by the end of that last six-week stretch that he had at the end of the Appalachian League season in 2011, He had turned a lot of heads. I won't say that he was even really a prospect by the end of that season. People said, okay, well, the guy had a really hot streak. But from from then, that was the start of something special with Kevin Pillar. And 2012, you guys got to see it here in Lansing. And then, obviously, in less than two years from when he was roaming the outfield at Bowen Field, he was in the major leagues with the Toronto Blue Jays. Less than two years, 32nd round draft pick, climbing the ladder that quick, pretty impressive. Um, some people still, I guess, don't even consider him a, a prospect. There are some people out there who still have some doubts about him and his ability to stay in the major leagues and maybe be an everyday player. But I think most people uh, understand that he's a very, he's a guy who can be a, uh, a major league player that's not going to float back and forth at some point. Once everything finishes coming together with him, that's a big league ball player. Trey Wilson is on Twitter, at Trey Wilson 757 And the Lansing Lugnuts are online at LansingLugnuts.com. Thank you very much, Trey. Thank you, Jesse. Y'all have a good one. From Lansing on down to Vancouver and Lucas Scott with the Canadians. Lucas, how was your Major League Baseball All-Star Game night? It was good. We were here at the ballpark. Uh, some of the players were watching some of the early earnings before we got going here uh, in Vancouver, and uh, it was fun watching uh, the guys in the clubhouse and their reactions, watching the major league players making plays and some of their pitching heroes on the mound. Uh, but it was uh, it was a good weekend. The delight that the players might have at watching the All Star Game, I can sense that Blue Jays fans have the same delight at seeing Max Pentecost go up the ladder and arrive in Vancouver. What was first the reaction with all of those folks around the Vancouver area and Canadians fans when they heard that Pentecost was on his way? Well, it was kind of one of those hurry up and wait things where we had the the idea that he would be coming here at some point in the season and then uh, finally got the go ahead. But then, as was uh, was noted, had some uh, some passport issues delaying his, his arrival here, so got a a couple weeks down in the Gulf Coast League. But uh, the media here was, was was pretty funny. The the press release went out just you know moments after he arrived here before uh, before his first game, and uh, and already the response was was pretty uh, overwhelming. The next morning we had sort of our media availability. The next day kind of gave him the first night to be able to settle in after his early flight and had a chance to. Uh, we had uh, two different TV crews here, a number of print reporters. So there was definitely a, a palpable buzz around uh, seeing about prospects of uh, of Pentecost pedigree here in Vancouver. And, of course, his very first game with Vancouver turns into a wild slugfest where the Canadians pull away with five runs in the eighth. He debuts batting in the cleanup spot. What a great game that must have been. 
Well, and then that whole series with Eugene, other than the one three nothing uh, game on Wednesday, has been a whole lot of, of back and forth seesaw, uh, lots of hits already here. The game we're we're actually in the middle of here in the top of six. We're up seven three, and there was there was seven hits in the first inning alone. So there was uh, again lots to lots to cheer about. And I, I think you know having a bat like Pentecost in the lineup really gives us that extra that extra player, that extra edge um, to kind of force the envelope and, and be able to create some chances. For all of those who have not seen Max Pentecost in person, what are your impressions? He, he wasn't nearly as as uh, physically uh, dominant, I guess, I was expecting from from someone that you see go in a you know, high first round pick. You know, got a solid build, very athletic build, but not not sort of the bulk or the size that you'd expect from a from a big blue chip prospect. Uh, very very calm, very nice guy. You know, great great Southern hospitality manners. Lots of time for everybody and. Uh, and flashing a big smile, and you know he also was able to make an impact right away here in his first game. Here he goes, he was flying in 4 a.m. flight to get here, and uh, went two for three, a double, scoring a pair of runs, and also uh, contributing with a sacrifice fly. So you know he's been he's been uh, great to have here so far, and we're looking forward to see him uh, you know blossom even more over the coming weeks. Talk about dominating. Roman Fields has dominated. Is this the earliest you can ever imagine somebody breaking a season-long record? I, I have to say that. Like I was saying, you know, it, it's become a, a weekly feature here. Whenever you talk about the Canadians, you have to talk about the play of Roman Fields. And I remember when he got that on that incredible stolen base run at the beginning of the season, when he found out what the record was, he said, uh, oh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be there next week. And, you know, it took, it took two weeks from, from the point where we talked about it to get there. But uh, it was pretty funny talking to him after the game on Tuesday when he broke the, the franchise record. And it was uh, kind of an innocuous play, got on first base, and the, the bases were open. And so I, I happened to be down there with a camera wanting to catch the moment. And sure enough, he stole second. And then two pitches later, he came down, stole third. And, and talking after the game, he said, well, once I, once I got one away, he said, I better get it over with in a hurry. So he just took off for the next base and, uh, and, and got it done. But he's just, you know, he actually even says that stealing third for him is almost a little bit easier than stealing second just because there's a little bit of uh, less emphasis. Pitchers tend to tend to forget about him, and they don't expect him to go as quickly as he goes from second to third. Obviously, you know, people are going to get the memo, and that might, won't, won't be the case going forward. But uh, it's been interesting to hear his perspective on that. The most remarkable thing to me, beyond his league-leading 26 steals, and the fact that he's leading everybody else in the league by 12, including his teammate Tim LaCastro, he's played 32 games, and he has scored 32 runs. He is good for about a run or maybe more every single night. Well, and he's he's absolutely the the best table setter in the league right now, and we really noticed that, and we finally gave him a day off, first one in seemingly you know a month. Uh, we gave him a day off in that day game on Wednesday, and uh, we really struggled to get anything going. We only you know cobbled together four hits, and we're shut out three nothing here at home. And uh, right away, inserting him back in last night, here we see another 11-9 scoreline, and he of of course is right in the middle with it, another stolen base again. So it's just really you know a guy that came in from from being you know, a non-drafted free agent, really kind of a, a relative unknown to such a huge part of this team's offense has been really, uh, really cool to watch develop. Another player who intrigues me is Chris Carlson. Looking at his hitting numbers and how things have gone, he looks like he's been a key contributor. Well, I, I love that we're just on the same wavelength. I know we didn't have a chance to talk before the show today, but he's another player that I circled to talk about here. You know, a 28th round pick in this year's draft and a guy that even honestly is someone that's here watching and covering the team every day who kind of slips out of the radar a little bit. You know, he's uh, he's not a big guy, 5'7", 180 pounds, and was kind of battling in a fifth, sixth spot in the lineup. And then I was putting together some game notes and looked at, looked like he had a 13-game uh, hitting streak that was snapped the other day. Still managed two walks. He's been on base in 17 straight games, you know, 323 average now. But really what strikes me is 450 on base percentage. You know, he's a guy that he's a few at-bats from qualifying for the league standings, but he'll be, you know, that number is good for top three in the league. And a, and a guy that just, you know, doesn't blow you away, doesn't hit a ton of, you know, doubles, triples, but just consistently finds holes in, in, in the infield, puts perfectly placed balls to the outfield and gets on base, and is just continually uh, in the mix. 16 walks compared to 10 strikeouts. That's not a bad thing, especially because there are maybe even eight on the order, and he's getting on. Is this Canadian's offense one of the best offenses that Vancouver has seen? Especially in, in recent years, I, I, you know, I think the prospects here have been, we've had some, some great stars, but 
it's usually been a uh, year. Once you get through your top four, you're just kind of hoping and praying that that players will be able to kind of make something happen. And and right now, from from one through through seven, sometimes one through eight, we got guys that are just continually getting on base at least once a game, often multiple times per game. So when you have a lineup that's built like that, where you don't really have any soft spots, it's nice to know that a rally can kind of come from anywhere when you need it. You don't necessarily have to rely on your top two or three guys to get it done every night. If they have an off night, suddenly you know, you're not floundering for offense. So I, I've only been here this year, but in terms of, of looking at, with the stats and, and following uh, the team locally as a fan, I think it's uh, definitely fair to say that this is one of the most potent offenses we've seen. From those hitters, looking at the pitchers for Vancouver, out of the bullpen, I think Francisco Grzeski stands out, although I suppose I could have pulled Jeffrey Del Rosario or a number of other pitchers, but Grzeski has worked 11 and two-thirds innings. He struck out 11, and he's given up just one unearned run and a 135 batting average against him. It seems pretty nice when you can bring in a lefty and just understand it's going to go nice and easily against him. Yeah, and that's been a, been a big thing. I think earlier on in the season we had some issues with our bullpen, but like you said, Grzeski's uh, obviously been been one of the top ones with his you know Sterling zero ERA. But a lot of the guys we can call on now, you don't have that sort of anxiety of hoping your starter goes you gives you five or six because then you're not sure what you're getting. A lot of these guys. Um, are managing to come in and, and do the work they need, work quickly, uh, get out. And, uh, and Grzeski, like you said, has been uh, kind of the top of the pile in terms of just efficiency. Um, you know, he's, like you said, 11.2 innings, but we were struggling to find uh, a picture for him for our, uh, for our card set that's coming out here because he works so quickly. A lot of those innings, if you go back through, are, are very quick, you know, seven, eight, nine pitch innings where he's throwing strikes and he's uh, allowing his defense to do the work behind him. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great thing to be able to, once you get a lead going into the game, be able to turn the ball over to guys like that. Grzeski is actually now in the pitch looking at the live box score. Vancouver hosting Eugene. And, again, the Canadians are rolling. Four runs in the first, one in the second, one in the third, one in the fourth. I know we have to get to our questions of the week before we can move down the ladder to Bluefield, but I have to ask, if only briefly, Franklin Barreto today, three for three. He's now batting 323. Had a couple of triples the other day. How much fun is he? Oh, he's great. He's a guy that, you know, obviously you know he's going to be in the in the lineup every single day. And, uh, and, and you know, there, there's moments where I think there was almost so much expectation coming in when he came out and started the season on that scorching start that I'm not sure maybe the, you know, the pressure got to him a little bit or maybe just even – expectations are were, were too high but he's right back in there now really dialed in at the plate and he was a huge uh, reason why we were able to come back in that game last night like you said with those two triples and he just he gives you that that poise that every time he steps in the ball into the box you know there's a chance sir, that he's going to put a real charge in the ball find a gap and uh, and give us extra bases which is really important at that key spot in the lineup the question of the week sent in from bluebird banter who is the best defensive player on vancouver that's a tough one. I heard you ask the the, the previous guys that one, and there's there's a few guys that kind of fit that bill. Obviously, last week we talked about the work that LaCastro's been doing at second base and helping turn a lot of those key double plays. Um, you know, our outfield has always been, been spectacular. Fields using that speed not only in the uh, on the base pass, but also tracking down balls in center field as well. Um, but uh, based on play from from yesterday's game, I'm going to have to give the nod right now to Ryan Metzler. Um, he's a guy that's come in here and. He's in the lineup every day. He's been, you know, have that hit and miss days at the plate. But he, uh, whether he's playing second base or third base, he's got a number of really, really great throws, uh, great plays. He had one yesterday where he had to range to his right at second base and do this sort of jeter uh hop off the off uh, foot and throw to first base. And he just made it look so routine, so clean, and uh, got the runner in plenty of time, much to uh, – so the surprise of the fans here at uh, Nat Bailey Stadium definitely gave him a standing ovation for his work there. So in terms of a guy that's uh, you know uh, really shown his ability defensively and uh, has a few highlight reel moments I can recall, I'd have to give the nod to uh, Ryan Messler. Lucas, are you on Twitter? I am on Twitter. All right, let's publicize your Twitter handle for everybody who right. likes to follow let's get you. Get some followers here. All right, sounds yeah. good. Uh, you can find me at. Uh, the underscore inside underscore edge. The underscore, uh, sorry, inside In, underscore inside, edge. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right, Lucas Scott with the Vancouver Canadians who are playing right now. Lucas, thank you very much. 
Thanks, Jesse. Appreciate it. We'll see you again next week. Line From change. Vancouver down to Bluefield, let's bring in Kevin Fitzgerald with the Bluefield Blue Jays. Kevin, it's been a busy show, but let's talk about your Blue Jays who are just steaming right on through. What has been the most impressive starting pitching performance you've seen so far? Hey, I don't think we might have to not look back too far. Last night, uh, Ryan Barucki, who's a lefty from Chicago, and Evan Smith, another left-hander, uh, scattered three hits and shot out the, the uh, Greenville Astros yesterday. And it was just quick pitching, attacking the strike zone from both of those guys. They worked fast on the mound. I think uh, I don't even think I might ha- not have to overthink this one because that's probably the most dominant pitching performance during uh, between those two guys during this last you know two week stretch or so for the Blue Jays. They've won nine of eleven. Um, there was a, a couple games ago when Jesus Tinoco and Dan Leitz, uh, two a left handed and Dan Leitz, and then Jesus Tinoco, he's a righty from Venezuela. Tinoco picked up his first win a couple days ago. He went six innings and one run ball, struck out six. There have been a lot of different uh, performances to choose from. Last night was terrific, again, between Barucki and Evan Smith. And then Jesus Tinoco, I think, would uh, would get a second nod because he has just been locked in lately. Uh, you know, a, a right-hander who is, uh, you know, just 20 years old, and he has been superb on the mound. There's been a lot of good pitching, and those are probably some of the top two. That has been the fun part, the fact that every single time I look at a Bluefield Blue Jays box score, and I just yeah. see those Gutex put up on one side. And on the other side, I don't think there's any doubt that Bluefield scoring runs because after your rough hmm. start to the year, it has been virtually nothing but victories. Well, you, you said it. You said it all right there. Uh, a few days ago, Bluefield played Prince and everybody in the lineup had a hit from one to nine. Yesterday, there were six Bluefield hitters that uh, had multi-hit nights. And you don't see that happen, you know, too many games in a row. And these guys, it's just a perfect formula right now. And, you know, it, it's funny because I think a lot of these guys were overthinking things early in the year. I was actually just talking to Danny Jansen, catcher for the Blue Jays. He's their everyday catcher and someone who, again, you know, has got a high profile and, and definitely this organization is high on. Just talking with him earlier this afternoon, and I said, Dan, you know, you're, you're on a – close to a 10-game hitting streak. He had another couple of RBIs last night against the Astros, and he just said, I stopped messing around with my swing. I think these guys are just simplifying some things. They've got some roving hitting instructors in town, Sal Fasano, who's a, a catching and, and hitting roving instructor with the Blue Jays. Doug Davis is in town. So you have a few of these guys. And, you know, I think what also helps is you get some of these guys roving around. They just had Tim Raines here last week. Once you start hearing some direction from – from other guys and from different voices. I think that helps also. But uh, in Dan's case, he, he went back to just simplifying his swing and, and the results pay off. I think these guys are getting great direction from the coaching staff lately. And it, and it really is paying dividends because you're right. There are not too many games you could circle on the calendar lately that were just ugly games. Uh, they lost to Princeton a couple nights ago. It was a two-run game. It was a close ball game. They haven't had many games where they have been out of it even in their wins. It's not like they have need massive comebacks to, to, to win some of these games. Again, they're, they're uh, 11 and four over their last 15. They've won nine of 11. So a lot of simplification and the, the results have paid off. No doubt. Shame of it. We're running short on time this week and yet questions of the week. Who is the best defensive player on the team? The best offensive player right now. Well, I'm going to have to give a nod to defense. a couple guys. Oh, excuse me. Defensive player. Uh, and you know what? I, I heard you talking, um, earlier about it yes i'd have to give the nod to there is a uh, a cannon of an arm that bluefield has in right field they call him gato around here it's jesus gonzalez uh and he's got an absolute whip out in right field he's probably thrown out at this point in the season uh you know i have to look it up i think it's about at least five runners he's thrown out at least five runners around the base path at second base at third base he's got an absolute cannon out in right field he plays it. He plays it well. He glides well in the outfield. He's got some uh, good range for a guy who's got. He's, uh, he's got a big build. You know, he's six one, one ninety. He's he's built, but he can also move around in the outfield well. Gonzalez has got an arm out and right, and manager Dennis Holmberg has kept him there because he's the. He's just got the best arm on the team. He's looked sharp, and then Richie Arena, a shortstop for the Blue Jays, he just plays a sweet shortstop, a, a great glove. I'd have to give the nod to those two guys right now. Kevin Fitzgerald is on Twitter. Kevin T. Fitz. Kevin, thank you very much. We'll get, give you more time next week. Hey, not a problem, Jesse. See you next Friday. All right. From Kevin in Bluefield, Lucas in Vancouver, Trey in Lansing, Tyler in Dunedin. 
Tom in uh, New Hampshire <laughs> working our way up bad in Buffalo in my haste. I might have uh, erred in a couple areas. I'm Jesse Goldberg's Jostler. This has been Around the Nest. We thank you very much. Look for us on YouTube. Thank you to Bluebird Banter. And enjoy your...